Well, now today I want to give you some teaching on how to become a Christian, which is about the most basic question we could ask in our religion. How to enter the kingdom of heaven on earth. How to begin the Christian life. How to be born again. That's my subject for the teachings that we're now recording on video for a wider audience to hear. You see, I have a burden. In counseling so many Christians, I've now learned something, and it's not to discuss the problem they've brought to me at the beginning. I now say to someone who wants counsel, tell me how you began the Christian life. Just tell me about your conversion. And I listen very carefully to find out if they had a good or a bad midwife when they got converted, whether everything that should have been done for the baby was done, whether they've really been fully born again. Now you see, birth affects life. A bad birth can produce a sickly, unhealthy baby, and a long, protracted and painful birth is to be avoided if possible. Yet looking back over my Christian experience, it took me 17 years to get all that I needed that should have been done for me when I was converted. It needn't even take 17 hours. It could even be done in 17 minutes if you have an experienced midwife. Now, I hope that most of you will get the chance to lead someone to Christ. But what you do for them at that point is going to affect the whole of their Christian life. The way we begin steers a course for us for the rest of our time. And for most of us, our conversion has been the biggest influence in our Christian life. Now, I'm afraid there are too many rushed births. Christians who are badly birthed, badly delivered. And the amazing thing I've found is this, that if we go back and put the beginning right, the problem they've come with either gets reduced or they say, do you know, I think I can deal with that problem myself now. It's as if, to use another metaphor, they're not firing on all four cylinders. Most cars I've had had four cylinders, four sparking plugs, and the Christian life begins with four steps. And if they're not all taken, you're like driving a car on three cylinders or even two. And you can still keep a car going on three, but when you get to the hills, they get a bit steep. And you can even keep a car going on two, provided you're downhill and the wind behind you. And there are Christians staggering along because they're not firing on all four cylinders. I have discovered, and here I'm telling you the, the heart of the teaching I'm going to give today, that there are four steps into life. There are four aspects to the new birth. There are four things that need to happen to every baby. Now, physical birth is a process. I went to our local midwife and I asked her to tell me what you had to do for a baby at physical birth. I wished I hadn't asked. She produced four typewritten sheets full of all the did. I had no idea it was so complicated just to get into this world. I now know much better. And I asked her a question. I said, at what point is a baby born? Well, she said, that's a debatable question. Some people say it's when the fetus emerges from the mother's body. Some people say that life begins when you cut the umbilical cord and tie it off. Some people say it's when the baby first breathes in and cries out. And I said, that's usually with the laying on of hands, isn't it? She said, well, yes, it is. Oh, you're ahead of me. You're with me. Same thing happens in spiritual birth with the laying on of hands, too. But she said, really, the important question is not to ask at what instant the baby is born, but to see that it's fully alive and that everything that should have been done for it has been done. Now, that gives me my theme, doesn't it? Because Jesus, when he said you must be born again, is saying that what happens to begin your spiritual life has some kind of parallel with what happened when you began your physical life. And just as all those things need to be done at a physical birth, their equivalent needs to be done at a spiritual birth. For example, cutting the cord and tying it off is equivalent to repentance. That brings the past to a conclusion. 
it cuts you off from that which ties you to your previous existence. Washing the baby, which is important to get all the remains of its previous existence washed away so that it starts clean, is equivalent to baptism in the new life. And laying on hands on the baby to get it to cry out, that's equivalent to laying hands on a spiritual baby so that it may breathe in the Holy Spirit and cry out in the Spirit. And that first cry tells you there is life present. So you see there's a parallel. Now where did I discover this parable? parallel? Well, I went back to the Bible, to the New Testament, and I discovered that many people are leading others to Christ without using New Testament language. And that's significant. When we get away from Bible language, it usually means we're getting away from Bible principles and Bible thought. So we've now got into the habit of a whole lot of euphemisms, which we use instead of biblical phrases. For example, we talk about people making a decision for Christ. We talk about people making a commitment. We talk about people opening their hearts to Jesus. We talk about people receiving Jesus into their life. None of that language is to be found in the New Testament. All of it has been made up from our own imagination. And because none of it belongs to the New Testament, we are actually getting away from New Testament thinking. That's why I like to stay with New Testament language. Let me give you an illustration of that. A minister once asked me this in a seminar, David, do you believe in being slain in the Spirit? I said, of course I do. It's biblical. Ananias and Sapphira were slain in the Spirit. And if you want the experience, all you need do is lie about your offering and have Simon Peter as your pastor, and you too can be slain in the Spirit. Well, he didn't want to know any more. You see, he was using a phrase that you can't find in the New Testament, and it leads you down a sidetrack from the truth. So I'm going to take us back to New Testament language, and through that, to New Testament thinking about the new births. Let me give you another illustration. You must have heard sermon after sermon on the text, you must be born again. How many of you have heard a sermon on that text? Let me see. That's just about everyone. Now then, Jesus said to be born again was to be born out of water and out of spirit. Now, how many of you hearing those sermons on you must be born again, heard an explanation of what born of water means. Put your hands up, please. One, two, three, four, five. Five of you. Now, all of you heard about born again, and yet you were not told what born of water means. And yet that's what Jesus said it meant. And we shall come back to that in our teaching. You see what I mean? If we're not careful, we take texts out of context and make them a pretext for our own thinking and the way we do it. I'm going to take you back into the New Testament, accepting what it says and what they did to help people to become Christians. Now, where, where can we start in the New Testament? We can't start with the four Gospels. That may come as a shock to you. Let me say something that will maybe startle you at this time in the morning. You can't find the full gospel in the four gospels. Because the four gospels cover a transitional period between the Jewish time and the Christian time. And you cannot find out how to become a Christian from the four gospels for the simple reason that full Christian initiation was not possible during the period covered by the four Gospels. Let me explain that. Faith in Jesus in the Gospels was not faith in Jesus in the rest of the New Testament, because Jesus had not yet died and risen again. 
So it could be faith in his name, it could be faith in his healing power, but it couldn't yet be faith in a risen, ascended Lord. Do you follow me? It was faith in the human Jesus who walked the earth, believing that he was the Messiah, that the Messiah's name was Jesus, but it couldn't yet be faith in a Jesus who was at the right hand of God with all authority in heaven and on earth given to him. Likewise, baptism in the Gospels could not be Christian baptism. It was simply a baptism of repentance, which John the Baptist practiced, then Jesus, or rather his disciples, practiced. And then it kind of dies out and reappears in the book of Acts with quite a different meaning. For now, baptism is baptism into the death of Jesus. It is a burial with Jesus and a resurrection with Jesus, which it could never be before those things happened. Therefore, people who had been baptized before Jesus' death were rebaptized after his death with full Christian baptism. There's a classic case in Acts 19 where Paul found some people who had only had the kind of baptism you find in the Gospels. And he had no hesitation in baptizing them again into Christian baptism. Are you with me enough? Another difference would be in the Gospels, no one but no one could receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, you can't receive him yet because he's not yet given, because I'm not yet glorified, so that receiving the Holy Spirit couldn't be part of becoming a follower of Jesus in the Gospels. In other words, the Gospels are too early for our study. They come too early before the death and resurrection of Jesus for us to find out how to become a follower of Jesus now. Then the epistles and the book of Revelation are too late for our purpose, so we can't start there. Why are they too late? Because all the letters and the book of Revelation were written to people who were already Christians. So you look in vain for any instructions as to how to become a Christian, because they already were, so that there's nothing in any of the epistles on how to become a Christian, because they're written to those who've already been born again. So what are we left with? We're left with one book, the book of Acts. And that's why this book is so important. It's the only book in the New Testament that tells us what gospel they preached in the early church and what response they expected to that gospel. We can actually watch the apostles on location in the book of Acts. We can watch them doing evangelism. We can hear what they said to inquirers. So it's with the book of Acts that we must begin when we ask the question, how do you become a Christian? Well, now we're narrowing it down. Where do we start in the book of Acts? And the answer is, with any account that is full in detail of how people became Christians. And there are two such accounts. One is in Acts 8, one is in Acts 19. One shows Peter and John at work, the other shows Paul at work. And we find in these two passages that they carefully took inquirers through four simple steps. And in the same order on both occasions. And the steps were, repent of your sins toward God, believe in the Lord Jesus, be baptized in water, and receive the Holy Spirit. And here are the four subjects I'm taking today. Together they make up what the New Testament understands by being born again, or becoming a believer, or entering the kingdom, or having eternal life. All these are different ways of describing what it is to be a Christian. Now I remember those four things in an easy way. I use the word rubber, rubber, and I miss out the vowels. 
And when I miss out the two letter E's from the word rubber, I'm left with four consonants, R, B, B, R. That comes in very useful when I'm counseling somebody, I can remember them easily and just work through them. R, repent. B, believe. B, be baptized. R, receive. And we've got our four steps. Now, if you go to those two passages, you'll find that very carefully they repented first, then they believed, then they were baptized in water, then they received the Holy Spirit. That is the normal Christian birth. Now, in the rest of the book of Acts, Luke, Dr. Luke, who wrote it, the only Gentile to write any part of our Bible, Dr. Luke doesn't mention all four every time. Wouldn't it be boring if he did? If every time somebody was converted, he went through the four. He usually highlights one or other of these four things, depending on what was the most striking feature on that occasion. For example, on one occasion, he mentions 3,000 people getting baptized in one go. That was so striking, he wrote it down. But he doesn't mention that they repented, or that they believed, or that they received the Spirit. Does that mean that they became Christians by baptism only? No. Luke is too clever a writer to bore us by giving us all for every time. So sometimes he mentions their repentance as the most striking feature. Sometimes he mentions their faith, sometimes their baptism, and sometimes their reception of the Spirit. With Cornelius, it was the reception of the Spirit that he highlights, because they suddenly received the Spirit in the middle of Peter's sermon, and it was so striking he just had to highlight that. But if you put all the accounts together, there is no exception to these four basic steps. There is nothing ever added to these steps, nothing ever taken away from these steps. This is how they became a Christian in the early church. They repented of their sins to God, they believed on the Lord Jesus, they were baptized in water, and they received the Holy Spirit. One of the most striking things that you notice about this is that they began the Christian life in a personal relationship with three persons in the Godhead. They knew from the very beginning that God was a trinity. Whereas many Christians have started their Christian life today with no relationship with the Holy Spirit, no conscious knowledge of Him. And sometimes they wait years before they get into that relationship. They go away to a convention or something and they hear for the first time, seemingly, about the Holy Spirit as a person you can know consciously. And so they catch up later. We should introduce people from the very beginning to all three persons and say, repent toward the Father, believe in the Son, and receive the Spirit. We shall see later that one of the reasons we don't do this now is because we now tell people to receive Jesus, which the apostles never did. And we'll see why in a moment. But as soon as you tell people to receive Jesus, you ignore the third person of the Trinity. In the New Testament, a person became a Christian by receiving the Holy Spirit, not by receiving Jesus by believing in Jesus, but by receiving the third person. So from the very beginning, they had all three persons of the Godhead in their conscious relationship to God. That's very important. Now, having found out from Acts this fourfold pattern of initiation, we can now go back to the Gospels, and we then discover that all four are anticipated in the Gospels. For example, read what John the Baptist said. John the Baptist told people to repent, to believe in the one coming after him, to be baptized in water, and that the one coming after him would give them the Holy Spirit and baptize them in the Holy Spirit. So John the Baptist was pointing forward to that fourfold pattern. We find that Jesus himself in his teaching 
also talked about all four things, but he never put them all together. He talked about repentance on one occasion, more than one. He talked about believing in him. He talked about baptism. And he talked about one day he was going to send the gift of the Holy Spirit. So he mentioned all four. Furthermore, when you look at that period between his resurrection and his ascension, when he gave his marching orders to the first apostles and through them to the whole church, he told them that they had a ministry covering all four. He told them to preach repentance to the nations. He told them to preach the gospel so that people would believe in him. He told them to baptize disciples in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he also told them to wait until they received the Holy Spirit so they could communicate the Spirit to others. So you can see the fourfold pattern is there in the Gospels, but it's never put together. And it doesn't have the full meaning it later had, but it's there. Furthermore, if we now turn to the epistles in the book of Revelation, all four are also to be found there, but not together. When Paul writes to Christians, he often appeals back to their beginnings. Sometimes he says, don't you remember that you repented and turned from idols to the living God? Sometimes he says, don't you remember how you believed in Jesus? Another time he will say, don't you remember that you were baptized and that when you were baptized, you were buried with him and raised with him? And at other times he will say, do you remember how you received the Spirit? Did you receive the Spirit by faith or by works of the law? And they knew they'd received the Holy Spirit. So that all these four things are scattered through the epistles as well. And in one epistle, they all four occur together in the right order. And that's in Hebrews chapter 6. And there, the writer, we don't know who it was, writing to some Jewish believers, says, I don't want to have to start all over again with you. You ought to have grown up by now. You ought to be on meat, not milk. I don't want to go back and have to start all over again with repentance, faith, baptisms, and the laying on of hands. He said, I don't want to have to do all that over again. Now, isn't that significant that all four are listed in the same order in which they occur in Acts, in the epistles? So we've now seen a fourfold pattern of initiation articulated in the book of Acts, anticipated in the gospels, and assumed in the epistles. We have seen now there are four steps. I call them the four steps to freedom, to being fully delivered. And it's interesting that different streams of church life have emphasized one of these four. Now you've heard of the liberal stream of church life. They don't have it all wrong, you know. And the liberals have emphasized repentance. They really have. And liberal stream in the church says you need to change your attitudes, change your lifestyle. Though they have tended recently to focus more on political and social issues of injustice rather than personal immorality. But hand it to the liberals, they have emphasized repentance. The problem is, if that's all you emphasize, it becomes salvation by works. You change yourself. But it's a good emphasis. The evangelical stream in church life has emphasized faith. And if you ask a typical evangelical, what must I do to be saved? He will say, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. He won't mention baptism in water, probably, and he probably won't mention receiving the Holy Spirit. He will say, only believe. So he emphasizes faith. The sacramental stream of Christianity, sometimes called the Catholic stream, whether Roman or Anglo, 
the sacramental stream emphasizes baptism and says you become a Christian by baptism, water baptism. And that's the answer they will give. And they will even say when you were christened as a baby, that's when you became a Christian. The Pentecostal stream emphasizes the fourth item of receiving the Holy Spirit, except that the Pentecostals usually teach two receptions of the Spirit, one when you believe and one when you're baptized in the Spirit as a kind of second blessing. Now all these four streams have got hold of a quarter of the truth. And the trouble is, whenever you take part of the truth and make that the whole truth, you get into heresy. And most heresies begin by taking part of the truth and blowing it up until it's the whole truth. It is not the whole truth that repentance makes you a Christian. It is not the whole truth that faith makes you a Christian. It's not the whole truth that baptism makes you a Christian. And it's not the whole truth that receiving the Holy Spirit makes you a Christian. My thesis, which I'm seeking to share with you today, is a very simple one. It's all four. In the New Testament, all four are necessary to entering the kingdom, necessary to being saved, necessary to entering eternal life here and now. So isn't it a pity that the different streams of church life are taking part of the New Testament truth and blowing it up so that it becomes so big you can't see the other three. If you see all four as belonging together, you are thinking more like the apostles in the New Testament. Of course, of the four, faith is the most important, and it's the one that receives the greatest emphasis. But it lies behind the other three. I doubt if anyone would repent of their sins if they didn't believe. Because what's the point of repenting if it's not true? Baptism, the essence of baptism is the faith you bring to it. Colossians 2 makes that quite clear, that baptism can do nothing for you unless you are in faith. Furthermore, Paul says in Galatians 3, how did you receive the Holy Spirit? By faith. So that faith is the key to the whole lot. But we need to see all four as parts of faith. When we say we are justified by faith alone, that doesn't mean faith without repentance. It doesn't mean faith without baptism. It doesn't mean faith without receiving the Spirit. It means the kind of faith that encompasses all four. Very dangerous to say we are saved by faith alone if it means cutting out those other three. We're saved by a faith that repents, a faith that submits to baptism, and a faith that receives the Holy Spirit. Well, now, I want to look now, in the rest of this talk, I've got ten minutes to go, at the two words or phrases which are used most frequently of becoming a Christian in today's language, both of which actually can be found in the New Testament. The first is the word conversion, and the second is the word regeneration, or being born again. Now, how do these two words fit into the four steps of the new birth that I've outlined. Some people say, which of the four is referred to by the word convert? Which of the four co is covered by the word regeneration? Now I want to try and relate the four steps to these two words. Unfortunately, in popular usage today, we tend to say that convert and born again are the same thing. But in the New Testament, they're not. They are two quite different words. So in popular testimony language, we tend to say, I was converted or I was born again, referring to the same experience. Well, now let's look at how these two words, conversion and regeneration, are used in this book. Because we should use them the same way, and then we won't deceive or mislead ourselves and others. Well, now the first thing we need to notice is that the word convert 
is not something that God does in the New Testament. It is something that men do and women do. And it's something they either do to themselves or to others. So strictly speaking, God doesn't convert anyone. I either convert myself or I convert someone else. It simply means to turn around, to make a U-turn. And it doesn't matter how long or short it takes to make the turn. Some Hollywood stunt drivers can skid round, it makes a spectacular sight. And some human conversions do a spectacular skid round and it makes a good testimony. But you may have just slowly turned around in slow stages. The important thing, the word convert means simply that you were going that way and now you're going that way. And you've either persuaded yourself to turn around or you've persuaded someone else to turn around. You've either converted yourself or you've converted a brother from the error of his ways. Let's keep the word convert for what we do. I either convert myself and make a U-turn or I persuade you to convert and make a U-turn. It's a human act of turning around. Now, which of the four steps does the word convert cover? The answer is all four. Because all four steps in the New Testament are in the imperative mood. We are commanded to repent. We are commanded to believe. We are commanded to be baptized. We are commanded to receive the Holy Spirit. Therefore, since we are commanded all those things, this is the human act of turning. So conversion is a human act and has four stages to it. I convert when I repent, when I believe, when I'm baptized, and when I receive and I'm facing the other way. So that all four are acts of men. But now comes the surprising thing. In the New Testament, all four are also acts of God. It says God grants us repentance. It says that faith is not of ourselves, it is a gift of God. It says that it's God who washes my sins away in baptism. It says it's God who pours out the Spirit upon me. Now here we've got an amazing thing. Repentance, faith, baptism, and reception of the Spirit are all acts of man constituting conversion. They are also all acts of God. And that's what the New Testament means by regeneration so that at every stage I am doing something and God is doing something. It's both. Now here's a little technical term for you. I'm still in the theology section, so it's a bit technical. Somebody came to listen to me for three months in Guildford and came to me afterwards and said, David, are you a Calvinist or an Arminian? Now those labels may mean nothing to you. Calvinists believe God does everything and Arminians believe we do everything. That's oversimplified, but you know what I mean. Calvinists stress God's activity, Arminians stress man's activity. And he said, I'm puzzled. He said, which are you? I said, well, you've heard me for three months. You should know. Well, he said, I don't know. He said, some Sundays I go home and I think, you know, David's a good Calvinist. And then, then the very next Sunday, you preach like an Arminian. He said, I'm puzzled. I said, you shouldn't be. You know the answer. He said, I don't. What is it? I said, I'm both. Because the New Testament is both. It is a beautiful cooperation between God's activity and my activity. When I repent, God is giving me repentance. When I believe, God is giving me faith. When I get baptized, God is going to wash me clean. When I receive the Spirit, God is pouring out His Spirit upon me. It's both. It's both conversion and regeneration. One final thing about regeneration. We've got stuck with the idea that regeneration, being born again, must happen in an instant. Now, if that is true, you have to look at the four steps and say, 
At what point in that process is the instant of regeneration? Your Calvinist says it comes before number one because you can't do the other four until you're born again. The Arminian says it comes between two and three. It comes after you believe and before you baptize. The Catholic says it comes at the moment of your baptism, even if that happened before the others. They're all wrong because they all assume that regeneration is an instantaneous miracle. But you study the word regeneration in the Bible and you'll find it always refers to a process of a number of stages which needs to be completed. It is not an instantaneous event. It is a process as physical birth is a process. So we cannot say about physical birth, that's the moment when the baby is born. Nor can you say of spiritual birth, that's the moment when the baby is born. What you can say is, the process of birth is now complete. The baby's fully alive. We should be far more concerned about getting Christians alive than getting people born again. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because birth is only the beginning of life. The most important part of being a Christian is not to have been born again, but to be living, to be alive in the kingdom and alive in the spirit. And if you're going to live in the kingdom, you need all those four things. You need a complete birth. You need a complete regeneration, a complete conversion. That then is the basic theology behind what I'm seeking to teach. I put a little diagram on the board. Here's a little oblong in four parts representing the four stages of repent, believe, be baptized, and receive the Holy Spirit. By the way, somebody has already pointed out that I said there were two E's in rubber. I'll bet you noticed cross out the U and the E, the two vowels from rubber, and you're left with that. Now then, we said that these four things are the work of God, which is what we mean by regeneration, and also the work of man, of man turning and converting. This is in the imper indicative mood, this is in the imperative mood, that means these four things in the imperative are telling us to do something. In the indicative, they're telling us that God is going to do them. Now, here's the interesting thing. If you take the number of texts under each heading in the New Testament and ask which is this text about, man's side of it or God's side, a clear pattern emerges like this. When you look at the texts on repent, most of them are directed to men, commanding men to do it. There are only two about God giving repentance. When you come to faith, there are more texts about God giving you faith and not so many about you believing. When you come to baptism, most of the texts are about what God does for you in baptism. And it's a minority of texts about what you do in baptism. And when you come to receiving the Spirit, it's almost entirely about what God is doing, pouring out His Spirit, and you receiving is a minor part of that. So that there's a movement from more man's work to less, and less God's work to more. So that it's almost as if, as you go through this whole process of being born again, there's less and less of you and more and more of God in the process. And this is why the texts on conversion are mostly about stages one and two, and the texts on regeneration or being born again are mostly about three and four, which is why Jesus said you're born again of water and spirit. Now isn't that interesting? so that the emphasis at the beginning of your new birth is on you converting. By the time you get to the end of it, the emphasis is on God's work of birthing you. So when we talk about being born again, we should be thinking of these two primarily. When we're talking about conversion, we should be thinking primarily of these two. 
Now there's just a useful framework for you to think about, but it does mean that stages three and four are the crucial ones in being born of God. The beginning of new life, that's the end of your old life and this is the beginning of your new life. And that's the essence of birth. It's a change.